Hey everybody and welcome to my YouTube channel. If you are joining for the first time, my name is Ryan Svensson and I am a music supervisor and I'm super excited to be making this video today because I'm going to be talking about my career path, my journey to become a music supervisor, uh, one of the most frequent questions I get asked whether I'm on panels or in my class is how did you get there? What did you do? Well, I'm going to be sharing all of that in this video in addition to uh, talking about the rollout of all the soundtrack and marketing and publicity materials for La La Land. I had the honor of working on that for about three years when I was an employee at Lionsgate. So I'm excited to share some of these stories and trials and tribulations because the entertainment industry and the music industry in general isn't always a clear-cut path. Um, when you are on your journey to become a doctor or a lawyer, there's certain accreditations that you have to take, whether it's boards or passing the bar. But in entertainment, it's not always clear-cut like that. So um, it's important to take some best practices, such as uh, getting an internship or becoming an assistant and having that patience and working your way up the corporate ladder. And I hope that me telling some of my stories today will resonate with some people, uh, especially if you're just starting out or if you've been in it for a little bit or you're thinking of joining the music industry or entertainment industry at all. Um, you know, the point of this video is for you to really just learn um, so that you don't make the same mistakes that I did or that you see something that maybe that you could capitalize on and make your journey easier. That's the whole purpose of this and to also just share some good stories. So I'm excited to dive into it and let's go ahead and do that. So as a overview of today, I'm gonna to be talking about my career path, how I became an intern at Warner Brother Records in 2008. And the year after that, I became a college representative for Warner Electra Atlantic. Uh, at that same time, I also was doing an internship at Vector Management, and then my first full-time role in the entertainment industry was as an assistant at United Talent Agency in their mailroom, and after about a year being there, I then joined uh, Azoff Music Management, which was owned by Live Nation, as an executive assistant there. So excited to dive into some of those roles and tell you about how I secured them. Then we're going to talk about Lionsgate and uh, when I worked there and what my job duties were and ultimately diving into a uh, deep dive campaign study of La La Land and how all the soundtrack materials rolled out for that. Um, I'm going to share some information on the trumpet and the arts, which was my original goal and the whole reason why I got into the entertainment industry. Um, it was kind of a crazy idea that I was shooting for that was not really feasible, but it allowed me to shoot for the stars so I could land on a cloud. And I think that's one of the most important things about motivation and having meaning and purpose is to really shoot, shoot for the stars. And uh, when I was young and naive in my career, that's what I did. So I'll be talking about that story as well. Um, I'm going to be talking about Millennium Media, uh, which I am head of music for and a music supervisor for and some of our projects, and also what music supervision is as a whole. So if you aren't familiar with music supervision, stick around to the end because I'm going to talk about what it means and why it's important for pretty much every single piece of visual media that we now watch. All right, let's get started. So. Uh, my journey started with the trumpet, and I was in fifth grade in public middle school, and we had a music class that I walked into, and all the instruments were out, laid out in front of me, and I was looking at the saxophone and the clarinet, and those looked crazy because there were so many buttons on them, and it looked very, very difficult, and fifth grader me saw the trumpet with three valves, and I immediately thought, okay, it's only three valves, so it must be the easiest instrument because, I mean, how hard could that be? Well, it ended up being one of the most difficult ones. Uh, the trumpet is notoriously tough just due to the physical aspect of it, uh, your embouchure setting on the mouthpiece, um, how your lips have to vibrate. It's a very unforgiving instrument. And when you first start playing, you kind of sound like you're an elephant that's dying. But 
Uh, my parents continually told me to stick with it, to keep practicing. And through that, I really learned a lot of discipline and repetition and patience that comes with the music making process. And I kept at it. And there are certain small wins that you get along the way, whether it's you start off as third trumpet as part of a jazz band and then you end up being first trumpet. In high school, I started practicing more. Uh, I went from two hours of practice a day to five. And then ultimately was taking a ton of private lessons. I was utilizing some youth orchestras that were in my area. I grew up in the Bay Area, so they had the Peninsula Youth Orchestra, which I joined my junior year. And then my senior year, I auditioned to be part of the California Youth Symphony, which I ended up being principal trumpet for. And both of those opportunities allowed touring during the summer. We went to France and Spain with the Peninsula Youth Orchestra, which really broadened my horizons culturally. And then we went to China with the California Youth Symphony. And that was absolutely fantastic. Went all over Beijing and performed in various concert halls. And so I, I ultimately decided my senior year of high school, I wanted to be a trumpet player full time. And how would I go about doing that? Well, a lot of people go to conservatories or universities to study it full time. So I started auditioning, uh, going into my senior year at various colleges. And I went, I flew to Juilliard, I flew to, um, uh, what are some others, Vanderbilt, uh, went down to USC, to UCLA, and really auditioned a little all over the place. And I ended up having a really good audition at UCLA. I loved the school and I loved how it wasn't focused purely on a conservatory so I'd get a well-rounded education. And luckily I got into UCLA uh, to study with Jens Lindman, who is was a member of the Canadian Brass and still tours a lot today and is an overall fantastic person. And um, so I was really excited to get accepted there and become a, a Bruin. And <laughs> in about in, in 2004, when I was also in high school, I was on MySpace one day and I was listening to some music and a song started to play called So Much to Say by the Dave Matthews Band. And I heard this awesome guitar riff and then all of a sudden a sax player came in and then a violinist and it was such a good groove and I started to listen to more of their songs and never before have I heard such instrumentation and improvisation in modern songs. And that really drew me towards the band. And at that time, they didn't have a trumpet player. So young naive me thought, hey, uh, I'm going to make it a goal to be Dave Matthews Band's trumpet player. And it's an obscene goal, you know, uh, but I thought it would be achievable. And I started to learn all their songs, to transcribe them to the trumpet, and uh, it really helped me become a better musician. And their discography is wild. They have so many songs, and I went to my very first show of theirs in 2006. And um, so that was on the back burner, right? That was my lofty goal to become a trumpet player or to perform with the Dave Matthews Band. And in the meantime, while I was at UCLA, I became a host at BJ's Restaurant and Brew House in Westwood. That's right on Broxton Avenue in Westwood. And when I was a host there, I would look out of the host stand that I was at through the window and see these premieres happen. They would shut down and roll out a red carpet and all the fans and stars would show up. And I thought, wow, that's that's a pretty coordinated effort with what's going on there. And it really introduced me that like at UCLA, I was in the, the center of it all. It was, there were so many opportunities. And especially when I joined the trumpet studio at UCLA, I was now a very, very small fish in a very, very big pond. Um, I immediately started to understand the ecosystem of how hard it was to get trumpet gigs, how tough it is to become a recording musician and how tough it is to join and become a part of an orchestra. So it was really, really eye-opening at the same time. And it was important that I joined a very competitive um, 
ecosystem because it really allowed me to learn more, but also to be challenged more. You know, if you are winning, you're not learning. And so I was certainly not winning at all uh, during my first couple of years there. It was a huge wake up call. And while I was at UCLA, I, um, I was still paying attention to the Dave Matthews band and all that was going on. I was going on their fan forums and then one day someone posted that they were shooting a music video in Santa Monica and I was like oh my god that's so cool they're going to be so close by and they actually put out a casting call for musicians to be part of this music video and they needed drummers, guitarists, uh, violinists, trumpet players and saxophonists and bass players like pretty much every member of the band they wanted other players of and my my heart and jaw hit the floor because this was my opportunity to potentially perform with them or to be a part of something you know bigger than myself and an opportunity that I always wanted so I went online and I found out who the casting director was and I sent them an email and I said, hey, my name is Ryan Svensson. I've been a fan of the band for quite some time and I'm a trumpet player. I understand that there's a casting call out for fellow trumpet players and I would love if you'd consider me for this opportunity. Uh, I'll be as professional as possible and I'll do it for free, <laughs> you know, even putting that out there. It was just a concise email and I didn't think anything of it. Uh, in terms of getting a response or I didn't have any expectations to get a response. So I sent that email out and the next day I got a response and it said, Hey Ryan, this sounds great. Let's stay in touch closer to when the music video happens. So I thought, great, you know, that's an opening. It's a possibility of an opportunity. And, um, a month went by and I, I knew that it was the day before the music video shoot and I still haven't heard anything. So I sent a little follow-up email and I was driving home that day and my phone died. And when I got home, I plugged it in. This was about four o'clock the day before the music video shoot. And there was a voicemail and an email. And I checked the voicemail and said, hey, Ryan, uh, we really want to cast you for tomorrow's music video if you could give us a call back as soon as possible And then I checked the email and it says the same thing. So I I, I panic a little bit and I call and they say oh uh, Ryan, thank you so much for calling. Um, you know, unfortunately we did fill up on the music video I wish you would have called about 20 minutes earlier and This was a no this was a, a hard no, right? And I had in that moment, a chance to rectify the situation, to still push back a little bit to see if I could get that to become a yes. So I ultimately said, hey, um, I totally understand. This has been a lifelong dream of mine for the past seven years uh, to be a part of something that the band does. And it would mean so much to me. So if anyone drops out or if there's any changes, you know, if you could put me at the top of the list or if there's anything that you could do, it would, it would really mean the world to me. And so they paused for a second. They said, OK, um, let me see what I could do. So they hung up the phone and then they called me back 25 minutes later and they said, uh, we got you a spot in the music video tomorrow. And so uh I couldn't even sleep that night. I was so excited uh, to be able to be a part of a music video for my very favorite band of all time, in addition to potentially meeting them. So I showed up prompt and early and on time, which is always really important to do, right? And this picture is actually from a show that I went to of theirs in Mexico. It was Dave uh, Matthews and Tim Reynolds, and that's Brandy Carlisle who opened up for them. And the next day, um, it was it was fantastic. I got to meet Boyd Tinsley, the violinist, who was a member of my fraternity, and give him the Sigma Nu handshake. I got to meet fellow trumpet player Rashawn Ross, who was so nice and so courteous, and um, just an overall fantastic player. And that's another thing is that upon my journey, uh, about two years in, uh, to me really loving the band, 
as much as I still do to this day, they ended up getting a trumpet player. But that doesn't necessarily shut the door on your dreams or, or potentially playing with them one day as a guest player. Um, and it also com- you know, really expanded my thought process on what trumpet could add to songs and how important horns are to songs because now they had a mini horn section with Rashawn there who does an absolutely fantastic job. I got to meet one of the best drummers of all time, Carter Buford there, uh, you know, always smiling, always chewing gum while he plays. And then ultimately meet my hero and idol, uh, Dave Matthews, um, who, uh, you know, one of the, the things that you might constantly be hurt told in your career is to never meet your idols. I say, screw that. Meet all your idols because you don't want to live in a fantasy land where everyone's perfect or your idols aren't you know mean or whatever it is luckily dave is one of the nicest people in the world and is so courteous and kind and uh we had a great conversation but i think that when people say that they're ultimately trying to protect you but in entertainment you're going to meet so many different personalities of people out there who could change on a switch with whoever they're talking to and that's how they play the game and so i think it's really important to meet as many of those personalities as possible because it will help you navigate really well in this industry um and so i ultimately got uh uh, my two seconds of fame in this music video which i'll show you real quick as well So there it is. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll give a little of applause uh, there. Um, that day, I got to perform with the Dave Matthews Band over 100 times. And every single time the director said cut or restart again, I was just beaming because even though I wasn't playing with them in, in a sense of being heard, it was still in the background and I was still doing it. And I was really proud of the, the goal that I accomplished in doing so. And what it ultimately did for me was open up a whole new avenue of me realizing what I ultimately wanted. Me chasing that goal to be a trumpet player for the Dave Matthews Band made me realize that that's actually not what I wanted. I I realized how tough it was to be on the road as a trumpet player. I realized how tough it is for a musician and the sacrifice that you ultimately have to make. And that didn't really fit with my, you know, ideals of uh, being a family man one day or Um, having a 401k or steady income and I knew the probabilities and how tough it is to make it into a band like that so I ultimately uh, pivoted and I uh, essentially abandoned trumpet as a career my junior year of college and started looking really behind the scenes of the industry and when I could of what I could be more of service to and what I could my skill sets were more aligned with Um, I was still a trumpet performance major but I ultimately had to pivot. And I did that by ultimately assessing the industry as a whole. And one of the most frequent questions I get in regards to the music industry is, you know, what capacity should I be within it? And it's tough to answer because there's so many divisions of it. You could be at a talent agency, you could be at a music management company, you could be on the publicity side, the marketing side, the digital side. There's so many different aspects, but it's really important to try to narrow into one of them. Otherwise, you're just going to be throwing arrows at everything and hoping something sticks. So the way that I ultimately got there was narrowing it down to me wanting to work at a record label. There were a lot of them in Los Angeles, and I thought that was an achievable goal to be an intern at one of them. So I 
made a resume even though I didn't have much on there, I used some of the things that I was involved with at UCLA, whether it was my fraternity, I won talent of the year as a Sigma, um, a member of the Sigma Nu fraternity for nationals. So I put that on there. I was a member of the marching band, which shows discipline and uh, commitment and teamwork. I was a member of the brass choir and wind ensemble. So little things like that that you could put on your resume that show that you're willing to take on tasks and put yourself out there and be part of an organization is what's important because we all start from nowhere at some point and someone has to take a chance on us and who's going to be taking a chance on us? Well, it's those that are willing to show that they have what it takes to um, tackle whatever the immediate roles are or, um, tasks are within an organization. So I kind of sculpted my resume really to to match that for a variety of these intern roles that were out there. I mean, as an intern, they're not asking you to, uh, you know, solve world hunger. It's more along the lines of getting coffee for your boss or making copies or, or going through in, inboxes on um, uh, Outlook or whatever it might be, right? So you it's about accomplishing those little tasks um, and showing that you're competent enough to do it. So the good news about this being back in 2008 is there's digital records of me reaching out. And so I actually wanted to show you my first email to Warner Brother Records. And the way that I sent this out was through a portal that UCLA has for um, careers and a lot of Um, colleges have these types of portals where people will post jobs and it's a really great way to tap into your network and so this email address is now defunct by the way I'm no longer spendtrumpet at msn.com but this is my very first email that I ever sent as to become an intern I said hey my name is Ryan Spencer I'm a sophomore music major at UCLA I'm interested in a summer internship program I'm highly qualified for this job due to my experience in the entertainment industry and management skills now, this is a little bit of a case of fake it till you make it because I I did have some good skills, but I didn't have any experience per se. Um, but, you know, I attached my resume so that they could get in touch with me. I included my MySpace link as well, which is defunct as well. But anything to get the leg up so that if they click on it, they could he- learn a little bit more about me. And to show you what the response was, it was just one word, availability, question mark. And I, at that time, I was signed up to take summer courses, um, but I actually called my parents and I said, you know, what should I do in this situation? And they said, any internship is more important than whatever you have lined up course-wise or if you have a, a, a part-time job lined up, um, so go for it. And so I immediately said, um, I stopped all my summer courses and I'm available the whole summer. Now this prompted a response that says possible to give me a call Tuesday as I'm out of, uh, out for the weekend to discuss further. So that, that stance of I'm available allowed another opportunity for them to then set up the call with me. If I would have said, Oh, well, I'm only available at these certain times. I'm only available here. Then it would have boxed me out of this potential opportunity. And the reason why I'm talking about this is that it's important to think about these things when putting the ball back in someone else's court, whether you're going to take some of their time or whatever it might be, you have to make it flexible for whoever you're trying to get something from. And as a music supervisor, I guess, ask for things all the time, but sometimes these things require me to do the work and not them. So that's why I'm kind of giving that overview. And it's important to think about whatever stage that you are at in your entertainment career process uh, and journey. Um, So I became an intern at Warner Brother Records. It was a fantastic experience. Um, I got to go to their headquarters in Burbank at the time and see what an office and corporate environment is like. Uh, my boss was Peter Standish, who's still a SVP at Warner Brother Records. Absolutely fantastic person to be under and to learn from. And I was doing small tasks. At the time, Metallica was rolling out their album called Death Magnetic. And 
they did not like how people were posting content from it on YouTube. So one of my jobs, and this was before YouTube had a content ID system, was to go through it and to request takedowns and gather all the links of illegally uploaded tracks of theirs. Um, so that was interesting. And I also was in some of the marketing meetings and I saw how marketing worked with publicity and how publicity worked with merchandise and how they would roll out these albums and I love the corporate aspect of it. Um, really nice facilities as well. And I, I met a lot of people. So it was a really beneficial internship and really got me excited about the industry as well. So as my internship came to a close in the summer of 2008, Warner Electra Atlantic had a college representative program and they didn't have an LA college rep. So I actually reached out to the director and I said, hey, are you guys thinking of formulating a position here in LA? And they said, yeah, absolutely. And um, can you pass along your resume? So I did. And they ended up creating that position in Los Angeles. And I was the first ever WIA college rep. And at Warner Electra Atlantic, um, it's an umbrella group of labels and it's their distribution arm. And they did a lot of grassroots marketing campaigns that we as college rep, rep, we as college reps had to really execute on behalf of. So one thing that was kind of cool was, and I'll tell you about this story, was there was a band called The New Kids, and they had a move called You're a Jerk, uh, or a song called You're a Jerk, and it's this dance move where you're kind of skipping backwards, and it was taken over the airwaves as well as... Um, really blowing up as a dance move. And this was before TikTok, so not everyone was doing the dance move or seeing it. It was mainly through their music video and other people posting content, but it wasn't as viral. And it was rising the charts, and they really wanted us to push it and infiltrate any type of activities that we had within our university that could help bring more eyes to it. Well, UCLA has a dance marathon where students dance for over 24 hours to raise money for pediatric AIDS. And I was thinking it would be fun to get in contact with the director of that event and to provide some merchandise and swag like t-shirts or whatever it might be to throw out to the patrons and then also have someone teach them the dance. I, I wasn't going to teach them the dance move. I cannot dance whatsoever. So I got in contact with them. They said this is great because they're always looking for ways to keep people engaged and excited while they dance for so long. And it ended up being a fantastic rollout because everyone was all, I think it was like a thousand people that were participating in it got, were introduced to the dance move. They all learned how to do it. They played the song several times. And then people also got excited with all the uh, swag that they ultimately got handed out. So it was a win-win and you look for those types of synergies within marketing and I wasn't really aware with what marketing was and I was doing it at a grassroots level with some of these artists and had the opportunity to do so. So I really loved that job, uh, worked with a ton of other different bands that were part of WIA, uh, WIA uh, Warner Electra Atlantic as well. And this was also a time when CDs were still really popular. So handing those out or getting t local tastemakers and restaurants to play them was important as well. And while I was at WIA, um, through a friend who was working as part of Azov Music Management, which was in Westwood at the time, again, the reason why I bring up location and geographic is why that's so important is like, you need to be where the action is in entertainment. Um, there's nothing that beats those interactions where you run into people or you hear about roles and sometimes assistant roles will open up and they'll be filled within a week because it's a revolving door and it's really important to be there. So going to UCLA and the Herb Albert School of Music really provided me with that opportunity. And Vector Management was part of Azoff Music Management, which was an umbrella of companies uh, that managed a bunch of artists. And that was right there in Westwood. And I went in for an internship there, uh, an interview, and uh, we hit it off and I ended up becoming an intern there. And their clients were Kesha. This was during her TikTok days, uh, which was her, her really big song and that album, uh, We Are Who We Are and all those fun songs, the, the rock band Seether and Emily Osment. And I really 
you know, the management side of things really opened my eyes to a totally different aspect other than uh, the label side. Because the label side, you're not dealing as much with the artists. You're dealing with more of their materials and the marketing of it. Uh, but on the management side, you're working so close with these artists in the rollout of all their materials, press interviews, um, their day-to-day -day travel, all that fun stuff. It's, it's like you're almost in a relationship with them. So uh, that opened my eyes to a whole different side of the industry. And when I was at Vector, I was there for about a year while also working at Warner Electro Atlantic. And uh, they were a smaller company. So they ultimately weren't going to have a position for me when I graduated or have an assistant position or an opening uh, for their office. And they were transparent about that. So they gave me the blessing to pursue other opportunities for my first role upon graduation. And so I started looking into talent agencies. And the reason why is all these talent agencies have a music division and I was music focused. So that's what, what I wanted to be a part of. But also um, looking at other people's trajectories on LinkedIn or hearing stories, a lot of executives start in the mailroom. And you might be wondering why this is and what a mailroom is. Well, a mailroom is literally that. It's a place where mail gets sorted and it gets delivered, but it's also a training program that is notorious within the talent agencies because they give you teachings and classes to really excel and to do well there and you learn about etiquette on the phones or whatever whatever else you know tasks that you need or budgeting or creating a budget or handling expenses and all these like menial small tasks that really mean a lot for any agent that you're working for or that you're assisting and and I was a huge fan of the show Entourage and Ari Gold here was the agent that was portrayed as Ari Emanuel in real life of William Morris. And I really enjoyed what he did. I didn't enjoy him as a character because he's often rather rude and disruptive. But what I enjoyed were the principles in the sense that he would be a liaison between an artist and what they are trying to achieve and accomplish. And he'd make deals come to fruition and always be in the know and be uh, someone that was a point person. And so I, I really aspired to be that and I wanted to be that. And so I set off to become an assistant at a talent agency. And the way I went about doing it was I didn't know anyone at a talent agency, so I didn't necessarily have an in. But what I did know were about these temp agencies. And what a temp agency does is they provide staffing for people who work at talent agencies when they are out sick or, or need uh, the desk to be covered for whoever the agent is that they're working for. And it's a great way to network and to learn and to just soak in how operations are within an organization like this. So I applied to one agency, uh, temp agency, and they were full. And then I reached out to this other agency called the Comar Agency. And they said, why don't you come in for an interview? So I came in and I had to take a Word and Excel test and meet with the, uh, the owner of the company, Leslie Comar, who is absolutely fantastic, and um, just kind of go through an interview process with her. And the next day, they actually called me and said, there's an opening at United Talent Agency in their music department. And again, the, these temp agencies get a ton of applicants of all different backgrounds, but they knew that I specifically wanted to be in music. And luckily, this opening happened the very next day, and they said, it's in their music department. And they said, we think you're a little green, though. Green meaning you're not ready for it yet, so... We uh, think that this will be a fantastic experience for you, and we're going to have you do the interview and let us know how it goes. And I'm like, wow, thanks for the vote and confidence, you know. And the next day, I had my interview at United Town Agency. I had to wear a suit because that is the um, attire that all the agents wear there. I found out that in the music department, it's way more relaxed across all agencies, but if you're in any type of like scripted or whatever department that you might be in, 
its uh, suit and tie. And it's very formal. And I actually like that as well because growing up and seeing my dad and go to work, you know, he always wore formal attire as well. So uh, I wanted to do that as well. And it makes you feel official, right? Uh, <laughs> fake it till you make it. Um, so I went for the interview and the person that I meet is one of the agents and it turns out they're going through their client roster list and one of their clients is John Hyatt who Vector Management represented. And so that brought instant bond in terms of familiarity. I now had a reference. I was now uh, connected in a way that I wouldn't have been before if I didn't have that internship. So the internship at Vector really paid off for itself in that sense. And um, that's another important part that I wanted to bring up is sometimes the monetary value might not always be in front of you for the arts. The opportunity might be greater than. So although I wasn't making, I think I was making $8 an hour at Vector at the time, it led to an opportunity where I could potentially get my first ever full-time position as an assistant at UTA. So the interview went great. Um, again, that John Hyatt plug was fantastic and they ended up calling me back the same day and said you can you come in for a second interview and that's when i met with their head of hr and they said you know do you really want to do this and i said absolutely i'm all in this is what i want for my career path and it'd be an amazing opportunity to be a part of again just in these interviews being excited uh looking up the articles about the company prior to so you could have something to talk about you don't want it's it's almost like you're putting on an act because not everyone's like that in day to day like i'm quiet a lot of the times during the day but when you're in an interview you want to show that you're engaging you're willing to help that you're excited about the opportunity which i was and i was eager to do and he said okay let's have you start monday so i started at uta on monday and um it was wild at first because i was again in over my head, similar to when I was at UCLA as a trumpet player. I'm now with all these other assistants who have way more experience, who know how to answer phones, who know how to handle an outbox and in inbox uh, that has um, hundreds of emails coming in every day. I was getting a call every 10 minutes. I had no idea who was calling. On my very first day there, I get a call and I answer the phone and I say, um, United Talent Agency, so-and-so's office, which is my boss's uh, office. And they go, um, hi, this is Renee. And I go, oh, hi, hi, Renee. How may, uh, how may I help you? And they say, this is Renee. And I said, okay, Renee, how can I help you? Because we're the line of defense between the agent and them getting calls directly and realizing who these people are. And I didn't have like a VIP list of who was calling or who to put through immediately. And so they just go, this is Renee. I am Celine Dion's husband and manager. And I freaked out because that is our biggest client for our biggest star that we represented on the, on the music booking side. And uh, I, I didn't know what to do. And on the phone, I wasn't trained either on what buttons to press and such. So I saw this big red button and I thought, okay, that, that's going to save me and help me. And I pressed it. And then I heard, nee, I heard a, a dial tone. And I, I realized in that moment, I just hung up on our most important client. Now I could say that was a power move and it was totally planned to establish dominance in the talent agency, but that is not the case. I messed up big time. And the way it worked at the talent agency as well as my desk was right in front of my boss's office who had a huge glass window door and there they overlooked Rodeo Drive and, and I think he saw the call come through because he called me and he turns to me and I'm looking at him and we're on the phone with each other and he goes, who is that? And I said, uh, I had to think really on my toes and I said, I didn't want to lie. So I said, oh, that was Renee, but the call dropped. And that technically wasn't a lie. The call did drop. I was the one that dropped the call, but it could have been because the, you know, the, <laughs> the, the line dropped or whatever it might be. And he said, okay. And so luckily Renee called right back. And in the meantime, I was able to ask someone, how do you put a call through to your boss or how do you forward a number? But yeah, so day one, I hung up on our most important client of all time. Um, these things happen though, but you have to improvise and learn and get better from it. And, um, 
at UTA, the primary duties that the music department had at that time, which has since expanded upon increasingly, like UTA's music department is wild now. Uh, they have so many more agents. At the time, there were only two. And uh, my jobs were assistant duties, but also interfacing with uh, promoters for routing music bookings and tours for artists. So they would typically start on the East Coast and go West and hit up various venues across the way. And uh, the agent would really negotiate those deals and get them the best deals possible for uh, their artists. So uh, it was a good role. The thing is, a lot of it involved numbers, which I wasn't really good at. And I was more on the creative side. And there's only so much creative that you could do with bookings. Um, because once you set up the dates, then you just really handle the ticket counts and see how it's going and if there could be any promotions to help boost those sales. But that really leans on the promoter. And that also involves handling the marketing materials for a lot of these artists and th making sure that they have their la latest headshots or uh, the materials that they are rolling out are of the most recent um, images. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever gone to Coachella, but when you take the 10 out there to Palm Springs area, there's all these billboards and they have a ton of advertisements of artists and um, their upcoming shows. And those materials are all provided by the agency and approved by the agency as well because you need to make sure that an artist's brand is in alignment with wherever they go and that they're not using old materials or unapproved materials because the last thing you want is a client driving out there and they say hey this is a press photo from 10 years ago or i didn't approve this or why why do i look like that so that's another role that we had to do at the agency and uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the climate. Um, you know, it's a fast paced uh, industry that you're in. You're in a mail room with about 30 other people. Um, I didn't get put in a proper mail room because the music department was so small, but in the mail room, it's really your opportunity to meet with so many other people and uh, network with them because statistically, only 2% of people ever become an agent that enter into a mail room. So everyone else goes off to all these other companies, whether it's Disney or Paramount or Netflix or Hulu or whatever it might be. And it's a really great way to just meet others because then they become your foundation and your friends in the entertainment industry and you grow together and you could discuss about landing other jobs. But the ultimate goal is when you're in a mailroom is to get on someone's desk and work your way up to becoming a coordinator and then to becoming an agent. So... I thought in the music department, especially here, there were a ton of opportunities to do that because we were just starting off and our roster was rather interesting. So there was Celine Dion, who of course had her Caesars Palace residency. There was Bob Seger. We did the music bookings and routings for Jerry Seinfeld um, and, and his tours, uh, the routings for Hall and Oates. Uh, towards uh, the end of, the, of my year there, they signed Rebecca Black, who of course was known for Friday. Uh, another group called Bliss and Esso as well, uh, who was an Australian band and emerging in the States. So um, a lot of interfacing with, again, these venues and making sure everything was set up for when they would ride through, um, including handling their riders, which is a list of all the uh, catering items or other little things that a band might want when they show up to a venue. You know, they get certain accommodations and they want certain water, or they want certain champagne or whatever it might be. Um, so that was all handled on the agency side, and it was extremely fast-paced, receiving so many phone calls. I I was a little over my head, honestly, when I got in this position, but it's not a reason why you don't go for it. You want to be challenged, and I, I definitely was. So after a little over a year of being there and a couple months, uh, the agent that I was working for was a junior agent, and she just got promoted. And I was really excited for this opportunity because she was going to start to take on new clients, I thought it would be awesome for me to assist her in finding a new set of genre of clients because there were certain unrepresented uh, communities and artists that weren't didn't have proper booking agents. So there was the, the world was our oyster, right? Um, but I noticed that when we were interfacing with each other, that our like the mojo was off a little bit and I could tell that she was getting frustrated and um, one day I went into her office to tidy up and I found a stack of resumes 
And I asked a couple of the other team members, I was like, are we, are we expanding or what's going on here? Are we getting more employees? And then I realized when I put one on one together that these resumes were to replace me. Um, so I knew I had my, my clock was limited and the hammer was ultimately going to come down, but there's nothing that you could really do. I just did the best that I could every day and trying to, to get through there. And, um, one day I go to my office and everyone else is left in the music department and I get a call from HR and they said, Hey, can you come down? And I said, yeah. And so I went down there and my boss is in there as well. And they said, you know, unfortunately this isn't working out. So today is going to be your last day. And, um, they talk about severance and I really, you know, in that situation, I kind of fought back. I was like, I, I really wish you would have walked me through this or talked to me, or we could have worked through this. And, um, I, you know, it, it was tough because I've never been in that position before and you never think that it's going to happen to you. And that's why I'm sharing that experience because you get bought back to your computer, your computer's locked. Um, this is again, just so that you don't go in there and do anything to get revenge. Uh, security was with me. I had five minutes to pack up a banker box and be escorted down to my car. And these talent agencies have a revolving door. They're the foundation of the industry, entertainment industry, but it's really hard to, the, re, the retention is relatively minimal there. Uh, a lot of uh, people who work for an agent don't even get their own email address because the revolving door is so quick. Um, so I was super disheartened, um, but I was still optimistic that you know my journey was just getting started and I wasn't gonna let this set back uh, bring me down. It just, I, I learned so much there and it was about now bringing those skill sets to another organization and brushing my shoulders off. But I got to networking right away. I put on LinkedIn that I'm on the hunt, that I'm available. And luckily, uh, someone from my previous job at Azoff Music Management, um, which is where I was an intern at Vector, said, hey, I'm leaving my role. Do you want to come work here, uh, let's let's bring it in for an interview. So I said, great, that, that's everyone who I was working with and close to during my internship. So the rebound came uh, a week later. I went in for an interview and I ended up getting the role at Azoff Music Management. And now, uh, different from being an assistant, I was an executive assistant. So um, also elevated my uh, title, which was a win in itself. and. I was also making more pay. So my pay at United Talent Agency was, uh, I believe, $13.25 an hour. And here I was making $15 an hour. So we were balling out. We were having a great time. Just kidding. I mean, I had uh, throughout my career as well, and that's why I want to be as transparent as possible with this. I had four roommates um, because that's all you can afford in LA. And that's how you get by is, is through that. And um, that's part of the sacrifices and the tough journey that you have to ultimately make to make to get into entertainment. And uh, it's not always easy. So that's why I wanted to share and be transparent about those salaries as well. So now that I was back at Azoff Music Management um, in a higher capacity from going from intern to an executive assistant, uh, some of the clients that my boss worked directly for or represented was Kenny Babyface Edmonds, Chris Mann, who was on The Voice and did Phantom of the Opera on Broadway, and Emmy Rossum, who, uh, of course, we all know from Shameless, but she was launching a music career as well and wanted to uh, drop an album. So we were helping her out on that. Um, we were involved with the creation of all the marketing materials uh, for these artists, whether it be the album covers, their press photos, uh, managing them in terms of getting opportunities for them, assessing them, seeing what's best for their career path, uh, and, and providing them with opportunities as well, whether it's brand partnerships or uh, new album cycles and rollouts. So we would be interfacing really closely with talent agencies, uh, again, for their bookings. So that at least I knew what that side of the industry involved now because I came from the talent agency side. So I had a better sense of how uh, the, the services that a talent agency could provide for uh, a music manager. And then also being on the label side, when I was an intern, realizing how an album works and gets put together. So I, always, I already had those kind of in my back pocket, 
but I didn't realize how much being on the management side involves with travel. You have to book their flights, um, arrange their cars, all these like logistics, the hotel rooms, all that fun stuff that is behind the scenes when it comes to an artist whenever they're traveling or on tour. And also being with them when they interface with the press and making sure that all those interviews go well and that they're media trained and all that fun stuff. But about um, six months in to my time at Azoff, uh, I, I was just realizing that it was my rapport with my direct report was um, not the best. So I realized I wanted to pivot away from this role and I started looking for other uh, jobs out there. And I actually went to this website called entertainmentcareers.net and I applied for uh, a job at Lionsgate, the film studio there, it was for a coordinator role in their music department to be working on their soundtracks and marketing materials. And I went in there and my boss there, who at the time was Tracy McKnight at Lionsgate, um, she knew my boss at Azoff Music Management and we were actually able to bond over that. So again, referring to referrals and people knowing other people, uh, this is what happens whenever you attend panels or events or you're able to connect with someone on LinkedIn or whatever it might be. You just never know who knows the other person and it could help give you a leg up in a situation. So uh, I went in for about four interviews at Lionsgate and ended up landing the job. And my duties there were to really oversee all the marketing materials when it came to soundtracks. We had a label there called Lionsgate Records, which was defunct, and they were probably going to try to get that up and rolling. But a lot of times we would partner with other labels like uh, Interscope or Def Jam or whatever it might be for certain uh, soundtracks, depending on the film that we were working on. But, um, you know, I, I wanted to take this opportunity to tell you more about my involvement there and then also go through what it entails to roll out a soundtrack on the magnitude of La La Land and what it's like during the awards campaign as well, as well as the filmmaking process when it came to La La Land. Um, this project first came across my desk as a script and I read it and it was absolutely fantastic and they attached the talent to it rather quickly. Um, Damien Chazelle was directing and Justin Hurwitz was doing the score for it and composing the songs. Um, Pasek and Paul were hired to be the lyricists for it. You might know them from Greatest Showman and Dear Evan Hansen. And the very first task I actually had for this was to find a piano for Justin Hurwitz. He wanted a specific one when he was recording the pre-records and that was a uh, Steinway M, a 1923, which I called all these different piano shops in L.A. and ultimately ended up finding, which was great, and securing that. But my primary duties were going to be involving the soundtrack, and we partnered with Interscope Records uh, for this soundtrack. And one of the fun things about a musical is that you have to do it backwards from when you regularly record a, uh, a film. Um, when I was working on the Hunger Games, they shoot it first and then we fi figure out the music for it or uh, then the composer ends up uh, scoring to picture. But when it is a musical, you have to record uh, pre-records first, which might not be the final version of the music, but it has to be the correct tempo and lyrics and everything else. Otherwise, the on-screen talent doesn't know what to dance to or to sing to. So Justin was really busy early on working on all these pre-records and um, the music supervisor, uh, Steve Gazicki, who's absolutely fantastic, was overseeing this whole process and I was working closely uh, with him in terms of uh, booking some of these venues and arranging these sessions. Um, again, Justin Hurwitz was overseeing that and Pask and Paul were doing all the lyrics for it. So. Um, Mary Stavries as well was the executive music producer for uh, La La Land. So we had our music team ready and locked and um, the music that Justin was pumping out was just breathtaking and absolutely fantastic. And uh, he was such a joy to work with on this. Um, but I wanted to get more into what it entails in terms of rolling out these materials to the public and as they are perceived and 
why it has to be sun, done so far in advance to br build brand awareness as well as to get people excited about it, right? Because marketing, as I learned in the grassroots marketing from my time at Warner Brothers, it makes you want something that you otherwise didn't have any intent of, of having. That's what the power of marketing does. When I um, uh, first saw a trailer of a film, you know, before seeing it, I had absolutely no intent of seeing this film. Now I have to see it to be part of the conversation and to discuss with friends and to uh, be culturally relevant. And I think that's the power of visual media and why so many people get excited about it. So one of the first pieces of artwork that was rolled out by the marketing department was the City of Stars key art. And this was time to the teaser trailer of the film itself. And I actually have a kind of a funny story about this. When this artwork was first circulated, they wanted it to have like kind of a blue note old record look. Um, and this was the, the, you know, leading song from the film as well. And the, the funny story about this is when it was first rolled out, there were actually four black keys. And I emailed the marketing department. I said, hey, um, is there an intent behind the four black keys? But it turned out that just the de graphic designer didn't know the sequence of black keys on a piano, how it's always three, two, three, two, three, two. There's never four. So they actually revised it. But that little things, and, and the reason why I bring up that story is it's important to raise your hand whenever you're part of a big organization or machine if you do see something wrong because it most likely can be and it just passed through eyes of people. My, my musical background allowed me to catch that mistake and they were able to fix it before the materials were rolled out, which was a, a nice win. Um, and then the festival key art was timed to the Venice Film Festival and uh, utilize the one sheet through the Venice Telluride uh, film festivals. These film festivals are you know, that you might hear about with Sundance and Venice are so important in building buzz about a project because uh, certain tastemakers and press are able to see it ahead of the public and start to generate some buzz about it. And so this is the iconic strike and pose that me and Sebastian do during their dance and with her iconic red dress against the purple background and skylight of LA. And uh, the tagline, here's to the fools who dream, which is from Emma Stone's song on there uh, called Audition. And this is a press clip that was generated from uh, the screening of the film at Telluride Film Festival showing that it got a 20-second, uh, a 20, 20 uh, two two mid ovations as well as a 20 second one at the end. So again, building the hype, a lot of people when they read press, it's their first time hearing about these things. So it's showing that it's being well received, which is great. Now the rollout of the film was going to be up against Rogue One in 2016. And these Star Wars films are behemoths. It's like, how do you perform better than that? And the answer is you really don't. And there's no way that we could top a film like Star Wars in terms of box office performance. So what Lionsgate Theatrical Distribution did was they re released it in five markets um, prior to the film's uh, total release, which allowed those markets to really dominate and perform well and build press and uh, buzz through that as opposed to being absolutely demolished by Rogue One. So you look for little wins in ways that you could go up against some of these bigger Goliaths and Lionsgate marketing and distribution did that perfectly. So a week later they expanded to 200 theaters and then they went nationwide on December 25th and then the, to IMAX in January. So instead of a, a press title saying La La Land is last in the box office or La La Land gets second place, this now says La La Land could be the year's most radical box office hit because, again, of how well it performed in those five theaters. Um, it earned 855000 from five theaters in New York and Los Angeles. That's a lot to earn from just five theaters. So that was a, a brilliant rollout by them. Um, this was the artwork for the song Audition. Again, just another piece of material to be used. And all these 
pieces of artwork have to ultimately be mocked up. Uh, and my job was to be the liaison between Interscope and Lionsgate for all these materials. So I would get assets from Lionsgate Marketing, send it to um, Interscope to make and mock up, and then I would give it back to Lionsgate for approval and circulate for approval on our teams. Um, I would also be in these meetings to talk about the various materials that we needed. Um, this was a special edition IMAX poster that was made for La La Land. Again, to just keep the materials rolling out and exciting. Uh, this was the artwork that was made for John Legend's song in the film Start a Fire. And this is a clip of the very first asset, the teaser trailer for City of Stars. And I want everyone to pay attention to this that's watching to see what's unique about this while I play this. So first and foremost, uh, on that clip, I just want to say that everything in this video is fair use in case YouTube uh, copyright strikes anything because we are discussing it and this is for educational purposes. Uh, that's the inner music supervisor inside of me. But anything unique about that? Well, I'll answer it since I do not have an audience. And that is that uh, there was no dialogue in that. It was all just song, so it leads to very mysterious um, rollout. You don't really know what the picture is about. You hear uh, Ryan Gosling singing the signature song City of Stars, of course. Um, uh, but there's no, there's no dialogue, so it's rather unique. And that's the first thing that everyone experiences when they first saw this film uh, or was introduced to it. Now, the second tra teaser trailer was Audition. And this is featuring uh, Emma Stone singing on this. Here's to the ones who dream Foolish as they may seem Here's to So again, not using any sort of dialogue or actual footage in terms of dialogue, 
uh, all song based to really introduce the music of these musicals. And again, th- that teaser trailer for Audition was rolled out a month, a little over a month after the uh, teaser trailer for City of Stars. And then we get the official trailer a couple months later, two months later, three months later, pretty much, um, which first then introduces uh, the characters as well as some dialogue here. I'll just two play a little options. Bit. You either follow my rules or follow my rules. Capiche? Thank you. That's actually Mary DeVries, by the way, uh, our executive music producer. I can do it a different way. Oh, that's, that's fine. Thank you very much. And then here we're being introduced to me and Sebastian's theme for the first time as well, which plays throughout the film, often alluring to their love for each other. And connection. You're fired. It's Christmas. Yeah, I see the decorations. Good luck in the new year. I just heard you play, and I wanted. It's pretty strange that we. And then throughout the trailer here, we also are introduced to another day of sun and a couple other elements throughout. I'm not gonna play the whole thing, but um, it just shows you how effective some of these teaser trailers could be, as well as an official trailer in terms of building hype, being part of the marketing materials, and also as part of an original musical, introducing the soundscape of how everything is going to be uh, laid out. So absolutely huge marketing materials there. Um, In terms of the soundtrack uh, and partnering with Interscope Records, we ended up going with Urban Outfitters as an exclusive um, partner for uh, some of the soundtrack's marketing materials. Um, You could see here in in researching as well, I had to look up a lot what a lot of past musicals have done uh, as precedent in terms of rollout. You don't want songs to be floating out there prior to the release so everything had to be top secret as well and we couldn't roll any of it out prior to because songs really are alluding to how things play out and you don't want to have a negative reception on a song without having to have a context to uh, the pairing to its visual media so as in terms of strategy we wanted everything to come out day of uh, with the film so We were able to announce a couple things prior, uh, which could get people excited, like a pre-order campaign and a vinyl pre-order campaign and revealing what the vinyl artwork would be. But we wanted the music to come out day and date with the actual film, which was uh, December 9th. So Urban Outfitters really had a a great fan base. Uh, If any of you have been to Urban Outfitters before, they always have a vinyl section and people that are really into music they have a ton of graphic tees as well and uh, merchandise that are music based so they offered a promotion where if you entered you would be able to win tickets to the la la land premiere and be flown out there which is kind of cool so again infiltrating their fan base and socials and promoting about it really brought awareness Um, we wanted the soundtrack and digital release and CD release to come out the day of the film along with the vinyl, which came out a week later. Vinyl just takes a long time to manufacture. Usually a lot of films have vinyl that comes out months after, but again, this was one of the benefits of having and working on a musical was that a lot of the materials were finished prior, significantly prior to the film concluding just because uh, the, the music had to be required well in advance. So we were able to manufacture and get all the vinyl ready um, prior uh, to its release, which really helped us. Now the score came out a couple months later, and that's just because the score was so big. There were four different um, vinyls for the score. Um, but to show you a press clip and how everything becomes coordinated, this was through Variety, and one of the things we did was uh, have a listen to City of Stars from the La La Land soundtrack arriving the ninth. So what we did was um, 
this is ultimately announcing that the soundtrack is going to drop on the 9th and those who pre-order will receive an instant download of City of Stars back when downloads were a thing, right? Like 2016 was really kind of almost the last year where before everyone really shifted into streaming exclusively and where the iTunes store was shut down. So one of the things that you're able to do, especially on socials and throughout is have embedded videos. So we had this mocked up and put on Interscope's YouTube page so that it could be embedded properly across all the press clippings. And this is why I love YouTube so much is that it displays the big, beautiful artwork. You could press play within it and the audio will play so users could experience uh, the audio as they are reading the article. And um, again, this just shows a kind of a cool rollout of and talking about the songs and get people excited for it so that they could be aware of it. Um, now, the musical components of La La Land in general that I was tasked with overseeing uh, was the creation of the vinyl, the CD, the digital version, and the complete musical experience, which included all the songs, including the score, in, in one cohesive body of work, as well as the box set. And the box set came a little bit later in discussions because it was going to be a limited edition item that included a holograph in there, um, a booklet that had all the lyrics as well as the first book that I've ever made and manufactured and I was tasked with doing. And of course, approval of all these assets, which is a lot because you have the score as well, which is in its vinyl, CD and digital version. And then for award purposes, you also have um, we made a 45, which is basically a single that had City of Stars on it on one side and the other song Audition on the other, which could then be given to the American Picture uh, Academy Motion Picture Awards. Wait, AMPAS uh, Academy of Motion Pictures and Sciences. <laughs> Sorry, I totally blanked there for a second. Um, given to them and their members for award purposes they still a lot of their members still listen to cds and it's important to have something tangible uh, which is also why we made those cds so uh, all these assets had to ultimately be created and manufactured and overseen and rolled out and with that you have to have all the audio files mixed and mastered and uh, gone through quality control process the vinyl has to be pressed and you have to listen to that for quality control all the artwork has to be approved and made and all the legal lines have to be manufactured the copyright the phonograph lines uh, all the credits involved have to be uh, approved uh, and then ultimately when these materials are printed by interscope you got to make sure that it's uh, of standards uh, and and comes out properly for the consumers to experience in a great way so this was the artwork for the soundtrack um, that mirrored the film artwork. This was the artwork that was used for the official soundtrack for vinyl, uh, which was really cool. And ha this is the billing block here. And again, I mocked up all the, uh, the verbiage here, as well as uh, the approval of all the artwork so that um, it's easy to read and it's to the standards of uh, approvals and who, uh, the guilds and whatever they need to approve. Um, this was the artwork for the score vinyl and the score album. Again, having different assets and different images for these products are really important because sometimes people buy the score thinking that the soundtrack songs are going to be on there and that's not true. Or they'll buy the soundtrack thinking the score is going to be on there. And those are two completely separate entities. In fact, the majority of the negative reviews about La La Land are people that are confused on those two points. They're like, oh, I bought the score, but there's no songs on here. And it's like, yeah, because you bought the score. They're, it's completely different things. It's like wanting an apple when you buy an orange. It's just not going to happen. So this was the uh, artwork and, and the box set that was put together for the complete box set. Um, again, this had the book in there that I created. That, that was fun. It had... I thought, let's put some uh, the original sheet music for City of Stars in there as well, which would help boost the campaign for City of Stars. 
and uh, this was an event that we actually held at the grow uh, at the Grove at Barnes and Noble, where Justin came by and he signed uh, a ton of these. Uh, again, just interfacing with fans, building awareness, and it got people super excited about the product. It sold out instantly. We also did a promotion with Interscope where Justin signed a couple thousand of the uh, vinyls as well, which was a really great bestseller. Um, this is an example of the artwork that was made for the Academy of Motion Picture Sciences um, for their members. Uh, this is what had to be made for, it's like, but they're essentially for your consideration uh, albums and given to their members. So there can't be any artwork on it or anything like that. Uh, but there can be for your consideration, best original score, Justin Hurwitz, and then for your consideration, best original song, city of stars. Uh, we really pushed city of stars because, uh, of a story I'll tell you in a second, but that was the 45 that we also made, um, with audition on one side and city of stars on the other. So, um, in terms of digital placements here, you could see some benefits of having that artwork and how it will show up on Apple Music. Um, you know, got the best of the week playlist on the main desktop page. You could see it was there. All these bring brand awareness as well as uh, encourage people to order the single or pre-order the album um, when they are on their, plat their preferred platforms. Um, I wanted to tell this story about the Ellen show because a variety of these types of situations could pop up at any job that you're at and you got to be able to think on top of your toes. So um, one day publicity reached out to me and said, Ryan Gosling is going to be on the Ellen show and he's going to be promoting La La Land. And we'd really, um, you know, he'd really love to give an audience, every, everyone in the audience, a vinyl of La La Land. So I said, okay, great. Let me reach out to Interscope and see if we could get that. And they, I said, how many are we going to need? And they said, uh, 300 of them, because you need 300 for uh, all the audience members and, and staff. So I said, okay, I could see if we could do that. So Interscope said, absolutely, we could get it to you by that day. And I said, great. And they said, well, one more thing. Ryan wants everyone to also have a vinyl player to be able to play the vinyl understandable right like I, I totally get that and the the issue is vinyl players are really expensive and to produce 300 of them that's going to be a tough ask but I started to reach out to all these different vinyl companies to see if they would be open to it and uh, a lot of them said no we simply don't have that in supply and we can't help out but I reached out to one company called vinyl vnyl and what they do is they curate three vinyls a month uh, based on your Spotify playlist and they send to you. And so it's a great way to discover music as well as get vinyls that you listen to. But they had the surplus to do that and they saw the value in the partnership and what it could bring. Uh, so they agreed to it. So I went to Interscope, got all the vinyls, drove them over to the Ellen show uh, the day of the taping. And then I also secured the partnership with that company vinyl. And this was an internal email that I sent out to the team, letting them know of what was going on. A lot of times when you're part of a big organization like this, you got to make people aware of what is debuting and when, because there's so many aspects that go into the various marketing and publicity efforts around the product. So because I spearheaded this and this is what happened. I said, Team La La Land this afternoon, Ryan Gosling taped a great appearance on the Ellen DeGeneres show, which will air on Friday. At the end of the episode, Ryan surprised audience members with the La La Land soundtrack and a vinyl record player. The La La Land soundtrack vinyl received wonderful placement and um, essentially 400 record players, not 300, 400 record players were given out, which is a $50,000 retail value. Tune into Ellen this Friday for the full episode. So this is Ryan greeting Ellen when he went out to the show. And this was the awesome placement that I was able to put together. Um, the, the record there is front and cover, and it's a great placement for the company vinyl as well to be associated with the airtime and La La Land and the, and the vinyl show. And it's like uh, the Ellen show. And it, you know, this all came together in basically a week. And so really about utilizing your resources and, and trying to find solutions uh, any way you can. Um, so that ended up being a, a really great 
experience. Um, some other things and partnerships in regards to La La Land that we did, um, there was an Airbnb open where various uh, vendors of Airbnb meet in a location around the world. And this year it was in LA and it's like, what a, what a better way for them to experience in LA than to see La La Land. So uh, they partnered with Air, the partnerships team paired with Airbnb open and they asked the music department if we could help out uh, because it was going to be a screen at the Ace Theater in downtown LA and they needed a jazz band. And we're like, well, we hired the jazz band for La La Land. So let's get the same people up there to perform for, uh, the, um, the screening of it for Airbnb. So this is a, an example of a mailing list that goes out to all their members. Uh, so you could see here and it says a red carpet screening of La La Land. Also Maroon 5 was performing, uh, at this open spotlight, which is kind of cool. Um, and this is the, the invite that went out for the carpet screening. So I, I was, I went there to oversee the band and everything. And Justin was on the panel there and Damon Chazelle and of course, Emma. And, um, it was a really great event because the band opened up and, uh, it was great synergies all around. And again, brought more awareness and, and being an advanced screening for La La Land to build more hype around it. Um, in terms of digital media and the rollout of it, these are some companies and uh, press that we ultimately target uh, to roll out the product. Um, again, so a lot of these ads have sometimes subconsciously been uh, ingrained into us where we ignore them. But when we read articles and it's there and um, you get reviews about it, it, may, it builds up more hype about it and it makes you want to be a part of it. So these are a couple of them that uh, were essentially rolled out on Instagram, uh, through these ads, through Facebook as well, uh, call to actions for people to reserve the tickets to purchase. Um, and then ultimately rolling out even newer assets once it becomes and gets that type of feedback of being critically acclaimed. This was really the poster that, uh, displayed that type of information. So, uh, all in all, uh, I wanted to share one more story and we were in a press, uh, um, a publicity meeting and everyone was in the room and I was the music representative there and they were rolling out these materials and luckily La La Land received two song nominations, one for City of Stars and one for Audition. And in all of our press materials that we were rolling out, we were advertising Audition, but I raised my hand and I said, hey, if we advertise two songs, we could potentially be splitting the vote because there were, it was a really strong song competition that year. There was also trolls by Justin Timberlake, uh, can't stop the feeling and a couple other big songs. So I said, we should really put all of our, you know, our ducks in order and, and go with city of stars and promote that first and foremost. And, uh, all the marketing materials did that moving forward, which really helped bring a push to make voters realize the song that they should be voting for and not bring audition the other song to the forefront. Even though I love that song and I think it's absolutely fantastic, um, it's better to get one win than, than lose uh, and split the vote by that. So again, raising your hand whenever you could add value to a conversation is super important. Um, so some accolades for La La Land. La La Land soundtrack reached number one on the iTunes album charts in 61 countries, including U.S. and the U.K., and number one on Amazon's music bestseller chart. It won the Golden Globe for Best Song and for Best Score by Justin Hurwitz, Best Song, City of Stars. For the Grammys, it won for Best Compilation Soundtrack for Visual Media and Best Score Soundtrack for Visual Media. The La La Land soundtrack peaked at number two on the Billboard 200. Uh, following its big night at the Golden Globes, where it jumped from 15 to number two. And that, again, just shows why award ceremonies are so important, why they help with publicity and traction. Uh, the Weeknd always stayed at number one. I mean, Starboy is a fantastic album, so hats off to The Weeknd. Uh, we never got to number one. But the vinyl soundtrack did peak at number one on the Billboard vinyl sales. And then it ultimately won the Academy Award for Best Song for City of Stars and Best Score by... Justin Hurwitz. Uh, so I wanted to uh, show you my my heck yeah moment. That's me with Eric Bollinger, who mastered the soundtrack for La La Land, and that was 
uh, me providing him with the very first copy of it. And uh, just wanted to play this cool moment and tell you a little story about it. I am so fantastic and just Justin Hurwitz, oh, Ben Chapman. And the Oscar goes to Justin Hurwitz, Ben Pasek, and Justin Paul for City of Stars, La La Land. The songwriting team of Justin Hurwitz, Ben Pasek, and Justin Paul are also nominated in this category for the song audition, The Fools Who Dream. Justin takes home his second Oscar tonight. All right, I'm gonna really quickly try to make some, a lot of people feel really good. Eric Feig, James Myers, uh, Amy Dunning, uh, Ryan Svensson, Lenny Wolf. So uh, when Justin gave that speech and uh, gave that shout out, you know, my phone blew up. I got 60 texts from friends saying, did he just say your name? Did he just say your name? And, you know, my heart was pumping. I was with some close friends when that happened. And um, I called my parents after and they were both crying and, it's moments like those that really make all the trials and tribulations of your journey worth it and the sacrifices that have to be made. And, um, you know, it, it was just such a celebration that it came back full circle in a moment where um, this project really took me on a journey from, you know, becoming into and molding me into uh, what value that I could add to whatever project that I go on f from now on. And, um, you know, I told you that story about how my very first job was at BJ's overseeing, uh, Broxton Avenue there. And, uh, this was me now on the other side of it, uh, working at Lionsgate. So it, w it really was a full 180 moment. And I got to snag this photo in front of uh, my very first job in college, uh, now, now being on the other side. So, um, that, that's my heck yeah moment and how everything came full circle. Um, the, the album ended up going, uh, platinum several times and, uh, I was awarded a RIAA, um, plaque with it as well. So absolutely fantastic journey. I learned so much from working at Lionsgate and working on La La Land and, when I first joined Lionsgate, you know, I never worked on a soundtrack before, and I worked on about 50 of them before working out on La La Land. And all that was just training and patience to getting to a rollout of a big project like this, and it prepared me for it. Um, now, with that, uh, after La La Land, there were a bunch of projects in between as well, like the Hunger Games. I got to work on the uncle drew soundtrack and go to that premiere which had a bunch of crazy fun artists attached to it like g easy um i got to assist uh at the simple favor premiere beatrice martin who performed at the premiere and whose music is also in a simple favor that was at moma in new york hit up the academy um, for deepwater horizon uh, Gary Clark Jr. did the end title song for that film and I got to walk him down the red carpet and be his handler and I'll also work on the soundtrack role out of that which was actually with Warner Brother Records and I got to work with my former boss Peter Standish on that so again you know working with people who I, I started my career with uh, growing up I loved Power Rangers and uh, got to work on this film as well and then um, ultimately, my story ends with Lionsgate uh, at Lionsgate by getting let go. And um, I'm going to tell you about it because it it sucks and it's an unfortunate thing. And it happens because you're at the mercy of these companies. And when you play the game and you join the corporate ranks and you go through the ranks, uh, this is a side that, you know, can could happen at any time. Um, not necessarily your faults. It could be restructuring, whatever it might be. And it was 2019, so two years after La La Land, and my boss went to join Netflix and brought a couple of people with her. And we didn't really have a direct report anymore in the music department. And at that time, I was also working in TV and had the opportunity to work on Nashville. 
and created uh, rebooted Lionsgate Records. So it was essentially running a record label as well and found a new revenue source for the company. And I was excited because it was in the six figures and it was bringing in some good money. And we started reporting to someone new who was uh, head of production, but didn't necessarily know the intricacies of music. And w I was trying to build a rapport with them, but um, just wasn't really getting a good read. And, you know, there's so many different personalities that you'll deal with in, in business and you're not going to be everyone's best friend. So I thought, okay, this is purely going to be business. And uh, it was the day of my performance review and I was really excited because I was excelling and I was going to ask for a raise and a promotion. And I went into their office and um, they said, you know, I know today's your performance review, but we're letting you go. And in that moment, I never had such clarity. I immediately thought back to my time at United Talent Agency when I was let go and I fought it and I was upset and I pushed back, but I didn't want to do that in the situation and I knew exactly what to do. And something just came over me and I just looked at, I looked at him and I said, the past seven years have been the most rewarding of my life and of my career. I've learned so much. And uh, I know that you've been here for about three months and you've had to let go a lot of people. And I know how difficult that must be and how hard that must be for you. So I'm going to pray for you. And thank you for this opportunity. I stood up and I shook his hand and I walked out the door with my head high because up until that point, I didn't really understand what powerlessness was or have been in a position like that. I mean, I was at UTA and it really helps me prepare for another moment like this that could happen in my career. But I was able to manage it in a way where I could leave with my head high and filled with as much as grace as possible. So ultimately learning from my past mistakes and how I handled UTA to leaving with grace and on a good note and um, feeling really, really good about myself in that moment. Um, I, and then I ultimately went downstairs and collected my severance and that was that. And, um, again, you often hear about a lot of layoffs that happen within the industry. And there's so many good people out there who are just, um, unfortunately, um, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know the right term, but they, they are, ultimately a result of some of these higher up decisions that end up getting made. But I wouldn't trade that experience of being there at that company for anything in the world. I learned so much. I met so many people and it opened up so many doors for me. And I knew that now I had a skill set that I could apply anywhere else um, in my journey. And a year uh, in, in 2016, I really started to dive into recording for trumpet more um, because it was my first love and I was missing it. And I didn't want to necessarily have it be uh, my main profession, but to have it be a supplemental income and to have fun and network with more people was the main goal. So I started to reach out to more people and say, hey, can I add horns to your songs? Can I be a value to a song that you're working on? And it started this journey because I reached out to this duo, producing duo named OG Volta uh, via Twitter and I said, hey, you know, I loved your work on John Bellingham's album, The Human Condition. Uh, do you guys need horns for anything? And they said, why don't you roll by the studio? So I did. And I get to this little studio and there's a closet, which they've transformed into their sound booth. And I put on the headphones and I'm working on a song and it sounds like Christina Aguilera. I was like, wow, that sounds like Christina Aguilera. And they're like, oh yeah, it is. And then I was like, oh, cool. So I recorded with them for about five hours. And then the song ended up coming out and it was called Fall in Line featuring Demi Lovato. And it ended up getting a Grammy nomination for best pop duo. And my whole intent was to start building a resume of songs that I could add, I've added horns to. And that's, uh, you know, that was a big one that uh, allowed me to get some more credibility and to show off my resume. And it all started by just simply reaching out and into tapping into my network in Los Angeles again. And then um, um, 
one thing led to another and the relationship continued and they asked me to perform on uh, the, song, the song by Shawn Mendes, If I Can't Have You. And this song ended up, you know, this is a big marketing materials on Sunset, ended up debuting at number two on the Billboard Hot 100. Um, it couldn't crack number one. Old Town Road held that for the, the longest time ever uh, as the number one charting position for a song ever. But it got number two. Uh, so that was kind of cool. That's a little press clip from that. In the meantime, I played trumpet the national anthem at a couple Lakers games. I got to play it up in the Bay Area at a Giants game uh, where I'm from, which was a huge honor. Um, and then most recently, I played trumpet on Lil Boo Thing by Paul Russell, which has gone viral on TikTok. It's number 51 right now on the Billboard Hot 100, and I hope that continues to grow. And this has all just been fun, adding value to songs and having my own home recording studio and being able to orchestrate and provide essentially a brass choir or anything elements needed. Um, I was introduced as well um, to 070 Shakes team and performed on, on her album and with her on stage uh, for a couple shows as well, which was absolutely fantastic. And um, one night I was at home and I got sent a song um, and I open it up and they're like, hey, we need you to record these horn part, these, these trumpet parts, um, just mirror whatever's in there. So I started playing to it and it was a really catchy song. And uh, and they said it was Lil Nas X. I didn't know who the, rap, the rapper was on it, uh, but I recorded it all, um, sent all the stems back that night. And then uh, it turns out um, it ended up being Industry Baby, which ended up becoming number one on the Billboard Hot 100. It ended up going platinum six times, and it was the first song that I played on that has charted at number one on the Billboard Hot 100. And speaking of marketing, these are all things that I'm paying attention to, especially because I'm in the industry. One thing that happened was uh, <laughs> Lil Nas X made his own shoe that had droplets of blood in the air cushion of it and uh, Nike filed a lawsuit over it, like a cease and desist, and, and Lil Nas played it up big time, like, oh my God, I'm going to jail, please help. And what ended up happening was all of that was a build up to the release of his music video and his sentencing to go to jail. He's like, oh, my court date's tomorrow, guys. Oh no, what's gonna happen? But it turned out it was actually just the rollout of the industry baby music video so i'll play what happens at the court sentencing in the beginning of this video and then the, what happens next lil nas x i sentence you to five years in montero state prison <laughs> Uh, such a fun music video and shout out to Nick Lee who made the horn lines there and that I was able to put trumpet over and the OG Volta guys and um, uh, take a day trip as well uh, for their fantastic job on this and then of course Lil Nas X and Jack Harlow um, but it's like you know just fun rollouts of that and fun things to be involved in and that's what keeps me going in the entertainment industry and to be excited to be a part of and help add value to in the little aspect that I can because, you know, identifying what your skill sets are and applying them, however, what they might ever be, you know, it's ultimately about getting in the room and being able to be of service to these, these properties and to these um, entities. So um, I was really glad that I really re-picked up my um, skill set and trumpet because it has led me on this journey into those opportunities. So I just wanted to share a couple lessons so far that I've learned from my career and my my path that I'd love to share with you all in conclusion of this journey and wherever it takes me next. And uh, that is don't let um, where you are currently discourage you from where you want to be. If you look at a mountain and look at its peak, you know, the, the journey could be very daunting. But if you take it a step a day, a step at a time, day by day, and focus on the path in front of you, it's a lot easier to conquer. And you'll be at 
the peak before you know it. So taking it in incremental steps is really important. And of course, there are so many people who have accomplished what you know you might be going for ahead of you, but there's a way that you could articulate it in your own words and make it your own path. And so don't discourage where you are from where you want to be. Um, make sure to meet everyone and network as much as possible. You never know where someone's going to end up. Um, be cordial to everyone. Be optimistic. Again, if you meet someone, it doesn't always have to include an ask. Every single time or a lot of times when people interact with me as a music supervisor, they want something from me, which could be rather draining. And uh, establishing a base and a connection and having the patience to do that first before expanding upon that relationship comes with any relationship. Um, so it's important to network, though, first and foremost, to meet everyone. And then think about how you could add value. At first, when I was starting off at, at you know Warner Brothers, there wasn't much I could add. I could just learn. And then at Lionsgate, I could add some of those marketing materials and publicity and um, skill sets that I had, you know, in my background and adding trumpet to songs. It's a very unique thing. So you, uh, diving deep down into your tool set and how you could provide value to whatever organization you join right away is of utmost importance. If you've handled phones before, if you know how to send proper emails, if you know how to make copy, you know, boast about it and, and sh say that you could master those skills immediately when you join an organization. Uh, another thing I suggest is don't ask right away for what you want because a lot of times people come into organizations and they might want something as uh, right away when really they haven't laid down the foundation to prove that they are able and willing and um, deserving of what they want. So patience is super important. I didn't ask for a raise for two years uh, at Lionsgate. Uh, and then I ended up, you know, advocating for myself, but I really had to lay down the foundation to have the credentials before I could move forward and be recognized in that fashion. And then read the trades every day. I'm going to provide a list of trades at the end of this that are amazing and super beneficial to read about because people change companies, companies change ways, uh, companies merge, and it's important to know who's and who and what's going on in the industry that you ultimately want to be in. And these trades uh, provide that blueprint and landscape in, in their daily postings. Get known for a skill set and excel in it. So the, you might have heard the term, there's a jack of all trades. Well, you could also be known for a specific skill set. And I think that's really important in entertainment because it's something that will help build credibility and establish you moving forward and be memorable. And then take chances, have an aggressive portfolio. And I refer this to penny stocks. Um, when you're younger, you could take more aggressive stances like I did when pursuing the Dave Matthews band or going for a crazy goal and not realizing what the consequences could be for it because you'll have time to reestablish yourself and rebuild. And you never know what's right in front of you in your inner network that could really help you accelerate and rise the ranks so it could be right in front of you so it's important to shoot for the stars but also utilize what's right in front of you and the the penny stocks or the people that are around you that might not have made it yet you can make together and then the other thing is never give up because the arts need you um, th this market some people refer to it as saturated or there's too many cooks in the kitchen but that's simply not the case uh, the arts have been struggling so much ever since covid um, they need good people. They need people that are going to push the envelope that are going to be involved with it and help it thrive and grow. When people think of America, I think of the traits that we excel at the most. And it's, uh, you know, one of them sports that we are fantastic at and the other is the arts. I mean, between cinema, uh, the film, TV, music, uh, it's just such a creative aspect of the world and your involvement in it is needed. You're appreciated. And I look forward to your journey and, and what you could accomplish on it. And I hope that my story helped provide you with some insight as to the path that can be taken and how you kind of have to diversify your portfolio as well in order to sustain in it. And, um, 
that is ultimately my story. So uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And I ultimately wanted to tell you a little bit about Millennium Media as well and what I'm involved with there. Uh, we're a studio in Bulgaria uh, that has offices in um, Sherman Oaks, but our studio is in Bulgaria and we have one in Greece where we shoot a majority of our productions. And um, we essentially uh, produce and finance these films and I oversee all the music for them. So I'm hiring the composers, music supervising all the films and finding all the songs and the musical direction for them. And then ultimately licensing all the songs and um, taking it through that process through payment and through confirmations and all that good stuff. And um, overseeing all the soundtrack opportunities as well for each of our films. So a couple highlights. As soon as I joined the company, I set up a co-pub deal with Cobalt. Uh, which was super beneficial to both parties to have someone admin as well as co-pub our, our back end on all of our songs and uh, score. Um, had the pleasure of working with Rita Wilson for the end title song for this film, The Outpost, which came out during COVID, um, which is now on Netflix. Uh, music supervised Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard, which was a really fun film and soundtrack. Uh, had the honor of working on a film called Jolt, which became an Amazon Prime original. Oversaw the music for Tesla with Ethan Hawke. Um, Till Death with Megan Fox, which is also on Netflix right now. And The Protégé with Michael Keaton and Samuel Jackson. Uh, the Offering, which is a horror film that Christopher Young uh, did the score for. The Enforcer, uh, another little fun film with Antonio Banderas. And then most recently, Expendables 4, uh, which is currently in theaters with Sylvester Stallone, uh, 50 Cent, Megan Fox, Jason Statham, uh, directed by Scott Waugh, and score by Guillaume Roussel. So uh, some upcoming projects that I'm really excited about as well that are all in post or hopefully getting wrapped up. Uh, the Bricklayer with Aaron Eckhart, Guns Up with Kevin James, The Piper, which is uh, about an orchestra that becomes possessed through its own melody. Uh, subservience uh, as well again with Megan Fox uh, Wanted Man written and directed by and starring Dolph Lundgren Red Sonja Hellboy the Crooked Man and Dirty Angels so I'm really excited and have been working hard on music supervising those films um, this was uh, the lyric video that I put together everybody for the outpost dies. everybody dies uh, this was a sad lamenting song that actually was written by the director um, in honor of his son and uh, Rod Lurie and um, played during the end title credits for the outpost as the actual photos of the servicemen uh, the fallen servicemen of the film were shown so really impactful piece of visual media and I thought you know how could we be tasteful and pair this uh, in a in a music video so I ultimately thought let's create a lyric video and pair it with footage from the film uh, which a lot of people are able to revisit and re-experience the film with um, now to dive into what exactly is music supervision I wanted to just walk through these points so that you could understand what it is as defined by the Guild of Music Supervisors so a music supervisor is a qualified professional who oversees all music-related aspects of film, television, advertising, video games, and any other existing or emerging visual media platforms as required. They identify, secure, and collaborate with any and all music-related talent, which includes composers, songwriters, recording artists, on-camera performers, musicians, orchestrators, arrangers, copyists, contractors, musical producers, engineers. So a lot of people, right? Like they interface with almost every single person. They liaise and negotiate with talent representatives, including legal, label, talent management, agency, business management. A lot of, you know, they, they are tastemakers and liaisons that facilitate this whole music when it comes to visual media. They liaise and effectively communicate with other related and involved professionals and support staff, directional production, editorial, camera, choreography, studio and network executives, advertising agencies, clients, label executives, game designers, distributors, and cost promotional marketing partners. They possess an accurate knowledge of all costs associated with delivery of musical elements. This means 
what a song is worth, what it costs to deliver these elements in terms of getting a hard drive and transferring it all or securing talent, determine and advise on financial uh, needs of project and generate realistic budget and uh, respect to all music related costs, deliver all music elements that are established in budgetary parameters. Um, advise on feasibility of scheduled based on release broadcast campaign or product delivery delivery all uh, elements consists with specific technical requirements uh, manage and or secure legal rights of new existing recordings clearances is sync a master two sides of every song use licenses of pre-existing music credits cue sheets with scheduling perimeters and determine the viability of creation and securing exposure of distribution of music related ancillary products soundtracks singles videos internet downloads the music video like i just showed you so it's a lot of details um i actually am currently doing a 11 week course at ucla extension where i go through all of this and what it entails and how to find music secure music what music is worth um we have a ton of interviews as well with reputable music supervisors who share their story so um, I wanted to also share that historically the very first film that used music, uh, that used sound that came out of speakers was in 1927, the jazz singer prior to that, a lot of films, they had to use a piano player who was playing live to picture. So music technology advancements have been insane these past couple of years. You know, you have your spatial audio, your immersive experiences with films, I just saw the Taylor Swift show, her movie of the Eras tour, and it sounded like I was at the concert with that Dolby Atmos sound. So uh, amazing in terms of the historical achievements that music has made in terms of making it to the airwaves. And, you know, who used to clear and license music back in the day? Well, a lot of producers did it. And the creation of the music supervisor is this is a specific skill set because it takes so much time and the breakdown of a modern film and tv studio you have your creative aspect uh, when it comes to music so these are the that the music supervisors the executives in terms of the soundtrack uh, in terms of a modern music department you also have your business affairs department who are structuring the and papering all the deals when it comes to these agreements when it comes to licensing songs or composer deal memos or whatever that might be. Um, you have your publishing division who are overseeing the maximization and exploitation of the songs that they have in their catalog. You have studios like Universal Music who have been around for over 100 years where they have such a dense catalog of score music that they could license out or they could uh, retain uh, revenue and royalties from so that's what the publishing divisions are for and then you have your music clearance department who are ultimately finding and licensing songs to be in their uh, their shows or TV shows or films or whatever it might be so everyone works together to provide a, a cohesive uh, product and in today's structure uh, you know the production relies on the studio for these uh, materials and you work closely as a music supervisor with directors and producers to ultimately have these assets come together and of course with the composer who's making all the original music so um if you made it to the end uh i congratulate you i had fun putting this together and uh, i hope you got something out of it and that you know you ultimately start or continue your career and path in the entertainment industry or the music industry. And I hope that we could interface in some way together in the future. So um, make sure to subscribe, make sure to follow me on LinkedIn or um, what other ever social platform there is out there and uh, keep on music supervising and hope to see you soon. Thanks so much.